Gig Gab, episode 398 for Monday, October 2nd, 2023. Folks, and welcome to Gig Gab, the show by, for, and about working musicians. Sponsors for this episode include Banzoogle, where you can go try it free for 30 days at banzoogle.com and then use the promo code GIGGABPOD to get uh, 10% off your first year of any subscription. So we'll talk more in depth about that in a little bit. For now, here in Durham, New Hampshire, I'm Dave Hamilton. You're in Santa Cruz, California, Paul Kent. <laughs> How's Santa Cruz today, my friend? Beautiful today. You know, this is the best time of year out here. You know, the fall is the is, is San Francisco, the city of San Francisco, too, that it's the best time of year, September, October, early November. The weather's beautiful. The skies are clear. It's just fantastic. That's great. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. Yeah, man. Hey, I wanted to ask you. Yeah. So that interview last week was something I, else, man. I had a bunch I, of, you know. Yeah, I want to talk about the interview, but I, 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 there's a couple, we didn't get to talk about our gigs for the prior weekend. And, and so I want to make sure we do that too. So I don't know, we can talk about the interview up front or we can, uh, you know, backload the sort of reactions to the interview. Um, Drummer's choice. I, I, Drummer's I, choice. Let's, let's talk about these, uh, let's talk about these gigs. Um, I had, oh. I had two really interesting lessons that I learned. One of them is a lesson that you and I have talked about on this show many times. And it's the whole idea of counting off a song in tempo, right? You know, finding the tempo, feeling the tempo. We were, we played a bitter pill gig a week ago, Sunday, and uh, we played among many of the songs that we played. We played this tune. uh, that's one of ours called come set on the porch spell. And I, it's one, it's a tune that needs to sit at the right tempo and so I like get it. I feel it in my body. I'm like, okay, yep. I, I, I know where it is. This is going to be it. Great. And then right as I started to count it off, somebody in the band stopped me and said, wait, 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 we need to do something. I forget what it was, right? It was, but it was some like, Hey, hang, hang tight for, you know, 20 seconds, whatever it is, did a thing. Okay, great. Now we're ready to start it off. And what I didn't do was to refeel that feel in my body again and get that tempo mm. again. I just presumed that I would remember it, but of course I didn't remember it. And I wound up counting it in faster than we usually play it. And it, <laughs> it made Billy really, he plays that tune on bass and he's got kind of a, it's this like boom, 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 you know, kind of thing on the bass and he groove. was cooking. Yeah. But it, it's better when it's better, especially for his fingers, but it's, it, the groove is better when it's at the right tempo. And it was like, Oh, yep. Never, ever assume that you will remember always, always take a second, breathe, do it. And it, it was really fascinating to be like, wait, I did that. But no, I, I did it and then got distracted by whatever the thing was. You know, I, I can't remember what that was. And then it was like, yep. All right. Then we're in. So, so here's a question for you. Yeah. You, you count off all songs in Bitter Pill and in, uh, and in Fling. A drummer always sets tempo. Um, you always count everybody in? No, not, not, I count off in Bitter Pill. I would say I count in most of the songs, but certainly not all of them. Uh, there's, there's a few tunes that Billy counts in. There's several tunes that um, start on another instrument. And so that person just starts it. I don't give them a count and, and have it come in. And that also results in variable, you know, fluctuating tempos for for songs there was one we played the other day mm-hmm. it was like oh this is really fast that like emily started on the you know on the on the uke or whatever and it was like oh yeah here we go this is cooking but I mean, it was fine you know it's like some of these songs it, it are not quite as technically challenging in in like the way that porches for say billy you know on the bass so it was like all right well mm-hmm. this is just going to be the feel of this you know a lot of them are like little two beat songs kind of you know country tunes or whatever so if we wind up playing it faster it feels more bluegrass if we wind up playing it yeah, yeah, yeah. you know what i mean it's like it's like fine whatever so so my question though is like you remember when you when you subbed for us yeah i count in three quarters of the songs mm-hmm. for the house rockers do you do you clue, like, do you think, 
I, I'm trying not to overgeneralize, but I'm about to yeah, overgeneralize. Sure. Do you literally clue in to the exact meter that I'm counting off? Or is it, or, or, you know, do you kind of naturally fall into where you, as long, like if it's close, so we're talking maybe five beats per minute in sure. either direction, right? Do you think drummers are really focused on the tempo of the count in or, or do they just naturally kind of go to where they hear the song in their head anyway? Yes. I, I mean, I can only, say, yes. I can only speak for, for one drummer in particular, Sure, but I, I mean, it depends on the song. If I know, for example, that a song, like that was the first time that we played porch that fast. And it was like, ah, oh, right. I can't let this happen again. Y you know, with some songs, like I said, it comes in fast. We keep it fast. It's fine. Porch was like, eh, I mean, it was fine, but it definitely couldn't have been faster than that. And probably if that happened again, I would slow it down within the first two bars. I have this thing and, and this isn't like a hard and fast rule, but it is a policy that if I'm going to change the tempo of a song dramatically and intentionally, uh, especially if I'm going to slow it down, it needs to happen in the first two bars. Otherwise, we're in, we're playing it, and we're, that we're just going to go with however it is. Mm. And a lot of that comes from, you know, playing for people that are dancing. You don't want to really overly mess with them, right, when when that's happening. So, so but again, it like it, it depends, but in general, it's like if we're going to do this, we're doing it right away. And, and then we'll, we'll settle in and, and we're good. Um, so for me, it, you know, when somebody else starts a tune or whatever, if it's a tune where I feel or have an opinion that the tempo needs to be in a certain spot and it's a problem if it's not in a certain spot, then I will take their count in with, with, you know, the appropriate number of grains of salt and I will just sort of drive it to where it needs to be. But, but otherwise, no, in fact, what I wind up doing is hearing that count in my head as I'm playing the first few measures and making sure I'm locking in and treating that as, as gospel, right? Like, I mean, yeah. we've been, we've been doing this theater show. I'm doing this passing strange thing and the, uh, you know, the, the music director will count in many of the songs. Uh, there are some songs where he doesn't count it and he just kind of gives us a head nod and we're in and with those, it's like, well, whatever tempo I feel like it's supposed to be is kind of where it's going to be. And, you know, hopefully I've got it close to right. And most of that is I watch the cast, you, you know, I watch who the singer is. It generally, that's my, th that's the person that, that matters most is the singer or the dancer, right? Is, you know, if somebody is, is, is dancing to this. I need to make sure that they are in their comfort zone. If someone's singing it, I need to make sure they're in their comfort zone. Um, but you know, there's, there's a lot of songs where Bobby will count it off and I will, you know, kind of replay his count in my head as we're playing the second, third and fourth measures and just be like, yep. Are we weird? Bobby counted this. Yes. Okay, great. Y you know, good. Now we're, we can, we're off to the races. We had an interesting thing on Saturday. Um, this show is running, they call it in rep with another show, which means that there's another musical happening on the nights that we're not playing. It's not like this is the only musical that's happening in the theater. It's a mu another musical called bat boy. And so we had to, the, that, that does not have the band on stage. And, uh, so we had to, you know, move all the stuff onto the stage for the, the, the two gigs that we played on, on Sunday when we played yesterday. And we realized when we came out, we went through sound check, everything, all good. Everything's fine. We realized when we came out and started the show that Bobby's, um, music director, Mike was not plugged into anything. So we did the entire first act without hearing him and a lot of it without being able to see him because there's people in the way. So that was kind of fun. <laughs> But, but, um, but yeah, I, I'll, I'll probably more often than not follow the tempo of the person that counts it in. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, cool. Yeah. Um, but again, now it, the play it to depends. A click is, a, is play to a click is, seems like an interesting thing to me because it would feel to me, I would assume never done it, but unless your drummer is really, really good, unless everybody's really good, aren't you like aware that you've pushed a little bit now you got to slow it down a little bit oop i've slowed down a little bit we got to get like aren't you chasing the click often isn't that like the the deal if you're not good at playing to a click it's, it's almost need, worse than you need to be comfortable playing to a click and everybody that's hearing the click in their ear 
needs to be comfortable playing to a click. And I say it that way because I've played some shows where, you know, only, and it, I, I don't think I've played any, I have to think more about this, but I'll, I'll say for now that I haven't played any like cover band gigs or rock gigs where I'm playing to a click, but I've done plenty of theater shows where I'm playing to a click. And with those, not everyone chose to hear the click in their ear. It would certainly, I would, and off almost always, and pro probably always the music directory. So the keyboard player would also hear the click in their ears, but it mm. wasn't necessarily everyone in, and the people that chose not to hear the click in their ear would just know to follow me. And, and that's fine. But yeah, there are moments where you're chasing the click um, there. And, and there are also m moments like, you know, if not everybody's hearing the click and somebody jumps the form, well, then now you've got a problem. You, you know, if, if yeah. the click is being used to trigger samples or something, it's like, okay. So you, you do need to have a, um, sort of a safety valve where you just, you know, hit the emergency button and stop the click and, and the tracks that might, the click might be triggering and just play the song, you know, by yourself sort of thing. But yeah, it's yeah. not, it's not that bad. I'm, I'm pretty comfortable with a click. My first drum teacher, it was such a, I, I, I'm sure I've shared this on the show. It was such a, a humbling moment. I'd been playing drums for like a year and a half. I was, you know, I was hot, right? You know, I was like, oh man, I can do this. <laughs> and uh, I get to my first lesson and he pulls out a manuscript, you know, a, a blank sheet of music and, and writes whole notes for like eight measures on there. And he's like, we're going to play whole notes. I'm like, oh man. I, thank you, but I already know how to like. I I know how to read. Like I I can do this. And he's like, okay, let's just just humor me. Let's do it anyway. And he starts the click up, and um, I, I I did not hit the second whole note in time, and that was the beginning of my uh, long history with the click track. And so I played a lot with a click when I was a kid, and and now it's I, I'm not perfect with Second it. Nature. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it can be, it is way more of a help than a hindrance for me. There are times mm. when it's a hindrance, you know, I'll be here tracking some fling songs or whatever. And it's like, oh man, like I got way off here. Like I got to just, you know, start that over. But that, but quite frankly, that's pretty rare. It, you know, I'll, I'll notice that I'm drifting off of it, but I also know how to drift back to it. And the click really becomes your friend because you don't have to worry. Am I speeding up? Am I slowing down? You just get to play and follow the click. It's, it's, you know, I would presume it's like anybody else. Like if, if you're going to follow the drummer, well, you just follow the drummer and, and it, you know, if you speed up, they'll keep you honest and the click just keeps you honest. I love it. It's great. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. 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 It's good. So speaking of click, can we bounce over and talk about last week? Well, I'll, I had one more thing about the gig that I wanted oh, to Oh, come on. About. I did. Bring it on, Dave. <laughs> come on. I, you got it. I the learned, floor is yours. I learned a second lesson. I got there. We did our own sound. I tuned up the monitors, and they were delicious on stage. In fact, I remember standing on stage and saying, oh, my gosh, these are delicious. Like, they were just so present, and, like, I could stand at either Emily's or Billy's vocal mic, and it was just, like, it was butter. And there was a guy sitting at the bar that laughed at me when I, you know, went up and had it all dialed in. I'm like, Oh, this is amazing. This is delicious. He laughed. And I said, if anybody complains about this, that's their problem. And then I went to tune the house and I asked, uh, Emily happened to be standing on stage. And so I said, Hey, you know, can you just talk into your microphone? I, I want to hear how this room is. Cause it was a weird room. You know, I, it, it, there was some soundproofing, but I'd never been in there before. It was in fact, I, I'd, I'd never been in there because it was a brand new room. They just built this at this corner point brewery. So I was like, all right, I need to tune the mains and make sure that we're not going to have, you know, weird, like, you know, reverberances and feedback and all that. And as soon as she goes up to her mic and talk, she's like, Oh, that's way too loud. And I'm like, well, the mains aren't, aren't even on yet. And she's like, Oh no, the monitors, mm. the monitors are too loud. And I made what I can only admit to as a rookie mistake. What I should have done was hit the mute button on the monitors and just have her talk into the mains. But I didn't. And part of the reason I didn't, I guess, is I wanted to hear what the monitor's reflection in the room was. And so I turned the monitors down. And she's like, oh, yeah, that's much better. 
And I'm like, yeah, it's much better because there's no drums behind you. There's not a guitar yeah, amp yeah. behind, you know, it's all the things. And, and then it took us, uh, you know, probably half the first set to get the monitors back to where they could actually hear. And it was like, Oh my gosh. Like I, I know what I should have done. It's what I would have always done. It's like, if you think it's too loud, I'm just going to mute it. I'm happy after the first song for you to tell me it's too loud because then we know, but it, in a vacuum like that, it's really hard to know. And I was like, Oh man, yeah. what a, what a rookie mistake I made. <laughs> yeah. Well, let me, let me share a story. So we, um, the coffee house gig that I talked about, it's a coffee house that holds about 60 people, 50, 60 people. Yeah. And um, last several times we played there, the band will get there early and actually, you know, play through whatever new music I've asked the guys to learn. So we um, we set up yeah. and we get, we're getting ready to play. And um, we started to the first song and one of the bandmates, significant others, you know, lovely person, um, winces, runs up. It's too loud. It's too loud. So there's a whole bunch of dynamics that go on here, right? So right. Is, oh yeah, that's a loaded statement right there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah well, there. So, so, you know, I don't want to be rude, and it's a bit of an untrained ear. Luckily, the woman who owns the place was there, and I. Shout it back to her. The sound. She goes, no, no, it's about where you know it should be, and it sounds different when the room is full. But that moment where you know, a the wince and the and the not quite scolding, but you know, like yeah, yeah, direct tone. Uh, you know, you there's a whole bunch of things you check off in your mind. Like, oh, I don't want to be rude. I don't want to you know be condescending. You know, but it, you know, it it's now created a vibe because <laughs> it was such a direct comment. Right. And, uh, uh, you know, luckily I could get a second opinion and that was fine. And after the gig, I said to the person, I said, you know, I didn't want to be rude, but, you know, I, I needed a different perspective. It didn't seem that way to me. Yeah. Um, but just had that moment of pause where a quote unquote untrained ear, not understanding the dynamics of the situation, the room was empty you know, all that type yeah. of thing. Yeah. Um, you most, know, most of the it, time when I have an untrained ear come and tell me it's too loud. I I've learned, and I'm not always right about this, but, but I will default to this. I've learned that that means the vocals aren't loud enough. It's, it's not yeah. that it's too loud. It's that the balance is bad for, for them, yeah. you know? And, and yeah. so my default when someone again, untrained ear says it's too loud is I'll go turn the vocals up. I'll give them another couple DB and like, you know, and then say, okay, yeah, we, we adjusted things. Let me know after the next song, yeah, you know, and oftentimes they're like, yeah, that's much better. It's like, great. <laughs> thanks not always though like sometimes it's actually too loud and that's you know how it uh yep. that's how it goes all right and today we get to welcome banzoogle back as a sponsor here banzoogle makes it super easy to build a fantastic stunning website and online store for your music in minutes all the features you need are already built in including dozens of fully customizable templates Tools to sell music, merch, and tickets commission-free. Mailing list tools to help grow your fan base and send newsletters. They've got integrations with Bandcamp, SoundCloud, YouTube, Bands in Town, and more so that you can easily add content from your other online profiles and integrate it all. And plus, if you have any trouble, they've got live support. And it's all from their musician-friendly team seven days a week. We've been using Banzoogle for Fling for a while now. I know, Paul, you use it in the house rockers there. It's because Banzoogle is made by musicians that are also nerds, right? Like they understand how to do the web stuff, but they also understand what we as musicians and people in bands and artists need. Plans start at just $8.29 a month, which includes hosting and your own free custom domain name. And because you're a Gig Gab podcast listener, you can go to Banzoogle.com to try it for free for 30 days and then use the promo code GIGGABPOD. This is all one word, G-I-G-G-A-B-P-O-D, right? You use GIGGABPOD to get 15% off the first year of any subscription. That's Banzoogle.com, and the new promo code is GIGGABPOD. And our thanks to Banzoogle for sponsoring this episode. 
So, hey, Paul, I don't know if you remember, but last week in uh, episode 397, we had Adam Moskowitz. I loved it. One of our listeners called him Adam Moscow Wizard here on the show. Do you, <laughs> do you remember that, Paul? I don't know if you remember that. I, I do remember. It was handsome guy, drummer, right? No, I think so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, Adam was awesome. I mean, what, is, what a story to tell. And, you know, a week later, just still thinking about... So many of the things that he took us through, super soulful guy. You know, I think his earnestness and sincerity about how much he loves what he does. I mean, you you couldn't spend that time doing all that tech work if you didn't really love it, right? That would be that would be hard. I still am um, fascinated, is the best word, by the concept of a band with that many subs and different people getting offered. You know, you know, I, it's hard enough to keep the same guys on the same page. Uh, you know, I, just the marketing of a group that could be different every time you see it. You know, oh, the Van Band's playing. Where's the rest of them? You know, that type of thing. That still strikes me as an interesting thing. He's built this brand that if you see the Van, the Van Band, it's going to be quality. Whatever I put on the stage, yep. you can count on it. It's going to be awesome. Everybody's great. They actually have four quality people available at each spot in a startup band that, that took a huge break during COVID and just got out of the gates after COVID. That whole story is remarkable to me. I mean, I just think it's just like a social engineering thing. It's, it's a pretty incredible story. So I've, I've been thinking about this a lot since we talked to Adam too, and lots of things swimming in my head. And I, I want to share at one of the more recent Uptown gigs that we did, it was a private party. We did at somebody's house. And as I got there, the owner uh, of the, you know, the, the, guy who owned the house came up and introduced himself, you know, and said hi to me. And I said hi to him. And, uh, and then Gary, the leader of the band took me aside and he's like, by the way, you aren't meeting him for the first time. He's like, we have played for him before. It was before you joined the band, you know, it was whatever, seven, eight years ago. And I was like, Oh crap. Like, did I say something that said, Oh, it's nice to meet you. And he's like, no, you didn't. If you did, I would have like nudged you. I'm like, okay, perfect. Got it. So, I've been in this scenario and it happens not infrequently where, you know, I am the replacement guy in a band and yet the band as a unit has played for these people before. And you just play that role like, oh, yeah, we're happy to be back and all of that stuff. And of course, I knew what to do after Gary instructed me and I was like, great. Yeah, no problem. And he knew I would know. And so. That's not that weird to me for like a, a cover band that's, you know, built to play functions and parties and weddings and corporate events and all of those things. This happens probably the, the idea of have, having a sub on a gig happens. It's pretty regular. It's pretty normal. And as I was thinking about this, I was like, man, I wish this was the way Uptown was run. I wish Uptown had all of these tracks so that I didn't have to put the energy into, okay, yeah. Okay. We got all these tunes. What's the set list for this week. Okay. Now I got to go through and make sure I have all the tempos in. Cause I don't necessarily know where to feel these songs. I just got to trust a, a computer to tell me, you know, and so I'll go through and I'll organize the set list and I'll put the tempos in so I can get a click before I, or, a, you know, at least a flashing click in my iPad or whatever, count these songs in. It's like, it's a lot of work. It'd be great if somebody else did that work. And I would love it if Uptown ran that way, but I know that Gary doesn't have the time and, and I don't mean to speak. This isn't necessarily a reflection, a poor reflection on Gary, but I don't think he has the technical skill to do what Adam has done in creating these tracks and, and all of that stuff. And that got me to thinking, what about the Van band as a franchise? You far, like, I don't know what the legal implications are of like, creating the things that Adam has created and then literally selling those for someone else to, to like license and use. Cause mm -hmm. like th 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 that would need to be sorted out. But otherwise, man, if he said, okay, look, I will, I'll sell you this franchise for all the van band stuff. And we promise that you'll have these 130 songs out of the gate and you're guaranteed to get at least four new songs a month that are part of, you know, this vibe and, and you'll be able to play them and all of this stuff. And you'll have, you know, the, uh, the entire Northeast or, you know, whatever region you want to franchise out from him. It's like, 
oh yeah, man, I, I would love to play in the van band somewhere, anywhere. You know, this would be great because it's a <laughs> it's a good gig, right? Like you're getting paid. Well. It's a model, yeah. It's a model, yeah, exactly. So I I don't know, like it kind of like the we have, remember we talked about the spasmatics. Mm-hmm. Uh, there are spasmatics all over the country. Same playlist, same costumes, and so you can't really tell who the guys are. Yep. But it's just it's a business model, and you just engineer that business model to death. Yeah, that's right. And you could even give each person in the band the same name, right? You know, the, the, the drummer could be Harvey or whatever. And it's, you're, you're, you are playing the role of Harvey this evening in our production of Van Band here at, you know, the, the, whatever the, 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 the Wentworth by the sea, or, you know, whatever your venue is like, that's it. It's, yeah. I don't know. I, it really, yeah. I, it, like to me that, that would be, I, hopefully Adam's listening and, uh, and I'm, I'm sure you are, Adam, like, I think, think about franchising this I, or whatever that becomes like franchising is its own headache. And as, yeah. a, as a corporate accountant, he probably is at least somewhat aware of what that headache might look like. But there's a world where this is a licensable thing. If you can figure out the, the legal gymnastics to be able to license what you've done for other people's songs and you know all that. And we didn't get too far into this with him about. He said he plays a lot of civic concerts and festivals. Yeah. And, you know, those are, in general, kind of like finite pace ceilings for those. In general. I mean, maybe not for him. But that's the other part. Like, keeping four pros at every role engaged for, you know, what, one, two, maybe $300 man gigs um, is an interesting thing. Yeah, but, but that's I guess, the thing. Know, there's just a lot of... Like it, it's a lot not of room for failure, right? It's that, there's you, yeah, because he's he's not beholden to anyone. The band members are also not beholden to him. So if I had this deal, if Uptown, like right now, if Uptown tells me, you know, oh, you know, if Gary says, hey, there's a gig or whatever, I feel obligated to play that gig, you know, as long as I can, you know, wrangle my schedule to make it happen because I know I'm the only drummer. Now he knows yeah. other drummers. He could sub me out, but it would be it that would be less a lesser product, or they'd have to rehearse or or something like that. I don't mean to say I'm you know the only drummer that can play with that band. Lots of drummers could, but you'd have to get somebody up to speed. Whereas with the Van Band, that path up to speed is a way shorter path, and you could you could drop somebody in and say, hey, you know, know these, go listen to these songs. And here's how this band works. And once they understand that, they'll be like, oh, this is like, this is cake. It's easy. So, uh, yeah, I, 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 yeah. And I don't think it's that difficult to convince musicians to be involved. Like, I think someone that is interested in even occasionally playing, you know, functions and weddings and that sort of thing. That's the model. It's certainly the model I would want. I haven't. I, I should I should talk to some of my uptown bandmates like, hey, would you like this if this is how this band was run? I bet every one of them would say, oh, my gosh, absolutely. It, would, it takes the pressure off the pressure of the, the schedule, you know, and the pressure of preparing for every gig. I don't know. It's it's it's. um, It's a thing. It's a, it thing. Is a thing for sure. Yeah. And he's clearly successful at it. So, clearly. you know. Yeah. Yeah. So may he long may he run. Um yeah, it, it it just we covered so much ground in that episode and the tech specs, the social engineering specs. You know, I love you know that he said every show he introduces a new song, yeah, which is great and quite aspirational, right? At yeah. least one new song. At least one new song, right? Right. Yeah. I know. Yep, because he likes to keep it fun. I think a big part of his success is this is going to sound stupid is him. And I don't just mean him in terms of Adam's willingness to run the band and organize it, but I think just his attitude is a big part of the success of that too. He's so positive. You can see from watching the videos that he's just Mr. Happy go lucky on stage. And it's like, yep, just follow the, follow the conductor, you know, and, uh, and it's going to be totally fine. Don't worry about anything. It's all covered. We're all here. Enjoy. It makes me think, you know, we've gotten such great notes over the years from from band guys from around the world, really. And um, hearing how other people do it is really fun. You know, I I know I get kind of locked into my way of doing things. I don't I can't ever see that I would do the way that Adam does things. Sure. 
um, for for a number of reasons, technical chops, not the least of them. But um, yeah, you got to be a nerd you know, to be able to pull pull the stuff together that he does for sure. Like, you, you know, yeah. That, yeah, that's not a I mean, it, it's not that difficult. I don't want to scare anybody off that heard that and said, I can figure this out. If you heard it and said, I can figure this out, you are correct. You definitely can figure it out. But it it's going to take a little bit of time and it, it to, to learn how to do it. And the Learn first, curve, yeah. the, there's a learning curve and the first few songs are going to take you way longer than the, you know, hundred songs that come behind them. So yeah. yeah. Cause what did he say now? Every song takes him about an hour to get locked up, right? That's amazing. That's amazing. Yeah. 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 I love it. But that was fun. I, th- I actually would love to hear more of that. I would love, you know, go back in. We've had some really nice notes over the years from really successful bands as well as, you know, people are just starting along, but the successful cover band thing is like, Fans who are in the top 10% of their market or 5% of their market, like what have they done to be successful? Yeah. And, you know, what is their model, right? You know, it, it, it what are we going to say? You haven't heard my Mustang Sally or my Uptown <laughs> Funk, right? I've, it, everybody has a much better story than that, you know, that is, is really compelling and interesting. Yeah. I think we should do more of that, Dave. I agree. And and, and next week we'll have uh, Mike Schulte from the Pork Tornadoes. Oh, yeah. Uh, so, yep. Yep. We're going to, we're going to talk to Mike. Mike's, Mike's been, Mike's been reaching out to us maybe longer than Adam was, right? Uh, possibly. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. It was, it was, and so, yeah, Mike's a good guy. He do, he has his own podcast, actually, the Confused Breakfast. We'll, we'll talk about that too next week, but, um, but yeah, yeah, yeah it's, yeah. Uh, so, you know, what, what is it? And he, Des Moines, Iowa, they're, they're playing huge gigs. Yep. Gotten cultivated a great fan base. They look like a super fun band and um, clearly guys can play really well. So and they cover a lot of material, you know, with four pieces. So yep. that's going to be fun. Yeah, and they they are not a modular band, so you're not going to hear the same story in, in a week. <laughs> yes. Yeah. 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 That's amazing. Yeah. Good yeah. deal. You got um, stuff coming up this weekend. Uh, I have four more shows of Passing Strange to do. I've got Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Saturday, um, and then I we're trying to figure out if we can do a bitter pill rehearsal on Sunday because we got a gig coming up on the fourteenth. Um, so we'll, we'll see if that happens, but yeah, we're playing, playing at the stone church with, um, Dan Blakesley and Do- Dr. Gasp. So that, that should be fun. But, uh, awesome. I've got, yeah. What about you? Yeah. I've got, yeah. Saturday. I have a new winery that I'm playing solo and someone saw I was playing there and, and brought their 50th birthday party there. So I picked up another hour and a half and, you know, kind of another, another shift, so to speak. Yeah. I'll play a double at that winery, but nice. I don't have to move anywhere. And then, um, oh, that was the other thing I was going to tell you about. So my my Central Coast Winery Band, which is a four-piece, okay. uh, bass, guitar, drums, and keys, um, the drummer is in Portugal. And we had a gig, and I called the venue and said, hey, can we do it as a three-piece? Would you mind? They're like, no. They were totally fine with it. And it's a tasting, big outdoor patio at a winery tasting room thing. And we did it as a three-piece, and we got <laughs> tons of kudos. I mean, people really liked it. And yeah, there were a couple of things where, where we were chasing tempo a little bit, but it's so fun sometimes where something you do one way for a long time, you change one piece and you just hear and feel and you, know, you hear what your bandmates are doing in a slightly different way. And it was really kind of fun. We got tons of great kind of huge tip day and, you That's know, never whatever, a bad thing. You know, the, yep. No, never a bad thing. So uh, it was just kind of fun to take one piece couldn't make it and we didn't. We just made sure it was okay with the venue and kept the gig and just did it and see how it worked out. Again, it wasn't a dance gig to begin with. So, you know, I knew that our our chances to succeed were pretty high, but it turned out being really fun. And we opened some things up in a different way and covered some time in a different way. And uh, it worked out really well. So that we're going to do that again because the guy's still in Portugal. So we're going to do that again next week on Sunday. And then I've got a couple weeks off. Uh, but the House Rockers have our big ticketed Halloween gig at the end of October that I'm, the tickets or sales are going pretty well. Um, I'm going to look forward to sharing that with you. So we've kind of, you know, talk about business models and fran- we've kind of built this two ticketed gig in, in one geographic area. And so my wheels are going like, yes, that is where it's pretty safe bet that we can do things. But this kind and and here's the essence of this business model. There are people that want to go dancing. They're probably a little bit older. Yep. They don't want to go to a nightclub. They don't want to go someplace that's super crowded. They want to know that they can get a seat, 
right? So, you know, these, these this is like a not a bad business model. So I'm really curious if we did it someplace where we had maybe less, but still some, you know, solid following, whether we'd be able to build, you know, a third and fourth event a year and do these types of things. And, you know, we pretty much have almost gotten rid of our club dates now. Um, you know, our, our winters are kind of all privates and our summers are kind of all festivals and concert series and privates. So I'm wondering if we actually can build that part of our business. We oh. raised the price to $59 for a, for a ticket and, um, and are experiencing no loss of interest. So it tells me there might even be more up, you know, I'm, I'm comfortable right here wow. where we are, but you know, yeah. So that's, that's not a, super, that's not a low ticket price. But the audience and the venue and the experience that you're, we're selling, it's, you know, and we're not the most expensive. There's a guy, we talked about him on the show. His name is Joe Sherino. He's probably the most famous cover musician in the in the San Francisco Bay Area for yeah. many years. I mean, he was like house band for the 49ers. And he was kind of first call for any big corporate gig for so many years. I think he was like $79 or $89, right? So, yeah. If you got and that, fans, and that's there, and there's you, no there's no food involved in that. That's just to see the band. Is that right? Yep. Yep. Well, I mean, if we no, think no. about where concert tickets are now, you know, like like a like a you know going to to an arena to to see some a list band or whatever. I you know, and I realize that bucks. yeah, it's exactly we're in easily triple digits for almost every touring band that's out there, right? Like you know, I yeah, there are some fish shows where. It's less than a hundred bucks. Garth Brooks, I think, on his last stadium tour, did eighty nine bucks a ticket for every ticket in the venue, and there could never be a different price. But by and large, you know, you're at one hundred and fifty bucks, and then some for, and yeah. maybe, and maybe, like you said, four hundred, like, is not uncommon. So to charge fifty nine, I mean, it's how you make money, and and things cost more now. We've we've inflated the economy, so yeah. Yeah. And remember, you know, a cocktail is 15, 18, 20 bucks. Exactly. So, yeah. And I, you know, the Silicon Valley is a, you know, fairly affluent area. Yeah. Right. Um, and again, the, the audience that's, you know, this isn't kids choosing to do this instead of going to the local bar for the night. This is a pretty mature audience that wants a good, safe, predictable, fun yep. environment. Yep. Big dance floor, like is a guaranteed a seat. They love the wines. We do special pricing for the wine club members, but the wine club members are probably only about 15, 20% of the total tickets sold. So, you know, it is, it has turned into a, a model that has some legs. You know, we've been able to raise the price a little bit over, over the three, four years that we've been doing this thing. And there's just a lot to learn about it. I mean, you know, luckily again, me having event management background right, chops, I know right. the basics yeah, of right. need to happen, but you know, it's a thing. And this is the, this is, this is the value of cultivating an audience, right? Like if people yes. know your brand and know your product and trust your brand and trust your act, um, you know, and they're like, you got to see these people and they bring two friends and, you know, how many, we also, like a big part of this is selling tables of 10. We, you know, almost sold out of tables of 10 wow. and it's almost as many tables as it is, you know, you get a discount. Sure, um, but it's almost as many tables as it is individual tickets. I mean, that's people get the idea. Like, hey, I'm going to bring all my neighbors. Or, hey, I'm going to bring my whole family. So there's something really to learn there if you've invested the time. You know, I go back to my great friend Dave Hamilton when I first started playing, who said, "On your breaks, go make friends, go shake hands." Most valuable piece of cover band advice I've ever gotten was, "Fans are money." Fans are gold. Oh, that right? it's not just and cover so, band advice. I, I would do that at original gigs. The the only place I don't do that is theater gigs. I, and there <laughs> are plenty of places I don't do that. The only place that I can get away with not doing it in a in an appropriate way is theater gigs, right? In fact, it would be mostly inappropriate if I went out and like, you know, glad handed the audience like at, at yeah. intermission. It'd be a little weird. But um but otherwise, every, original gigs for sure. Like these people come out to see you. It, they're they're not there just for the songs, right? Like I mean, it, they they're there for the songs that you play, and you're the only band that plays them, right? So it's it. I would I would argue it's just as important, perhaps even more important. But but I don't think it's I don't think there's degrees of importance of this. I, I think it's if if people are coming out to see you play. Go talk to them, get them on your mailing list, like go do all the things because that's what 
brings them back. It's not going to bring 100% of them back. It might bring, let's say 10%, but it might be 50. But 10% is better than 0%. And zero is what you're going to get if you don't do it. Yeah. So, yep. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you what you you create that connection. Yes. And and it 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 sprouts. I mean, it just it, you know it just grows branches and branches and branches, and it leads to you know more event referrals, more private event referrals. You know, and again, if you have an audience, at least out in California, you can almost write your ticket, right? Yep. If you are gonna be bring people who sell beer at a festival, you can get a top spot at a festival. If you're gonna bring people who buy drinks. You can, you know, cut a deal where you get the door, yeah. you know, at a club and or or whatever it is that you want to get. So, it, it, that that you told me that right when I was starting to play again, right after you and I played together, and most useful bit of of cover band. And yes, it's really business advice, but most useful bit of cover band advice I've ever had, and, and it's paid so many droves for us. Uh, you know, and luckily I have a bunch of guys in my group who like to go out and you know meet the people and yeah, those connections, you know. It, it they're matters. Just, they're money. They're they're gold. Yep. And, and it is, actually makes your life as a musician even even more fun to see familiar faces who you know are rooting for you when they come to see you. That you know, have a homer crowd. Any any gig can turn into a party. Well, and and the best part is when it gets to a point where the people that come to see you start self organizing, right? And and are yep. happy not just to be there to see you, but happy to be there to see each other. And when that starts to happen, man, like protect that with everything you have, mm -hmm. because that's the thing that's going to get you there. Yeah. So, yeah, we had, um, you know, most communities have these things where like singles groups. Yeah. Often like, you know, second marriage, you know, where, where divorced people, singles groups self-organize on the Internet. And if you can get in with those people that's like an instant audience of 40, 50, a hundred people at some of your gigs. Right. Oh, yeah. And all it takes is thanking them for coming, introducing yourself, making a little bit of personal touch, uh, you know, acknowledging them on the dance floor every once in a while, acknowledging the name of their group, really easy things. And all of a sudden you just inherited, you know, a group. And so if they're saying, where should we go dancing tonight? Where should we go listen to music tonight? You know, your, your name should be higher in the, in the yeah. pecking order than someone who they don't know. Who they don't Just know. Just makes sense. Yep. Oh, yeah. They're a great crowd. Oh, let's go there. Yeah. I like that. Oh, that's, yeah. Yeah. See, this is thinking, folks. This is why we love Mr. Paul Kent here. Uh, I'm back at you. Yeah, man. Um, That's what I got for this week. You got anything else? I do not, but right. it was a good chat and yeah. fun to relive the fun from last week and glad to hear the theater gigs are going good. Yeah. And uh, let's do it again next week. How about that? We'll do it again next week. Yeah. Will you um, do me a favor, if if at all possible, and bring your your real podcast mic so people don't have to hear me echo every now and then off of uh, your your MacBook mic there? Because I because with Mike on the show, it, it really makes a difference when we have like everybody in in sync and all that good stuff. Because instead of Santa Cruz, California, we'll be back in Napomo, California. Not a problem. All right. Thank you, my friend. I appreciate that, and I know there's several listeners out there who. We'll also appreciate that. Folks, thank you for listening. Share the show with your bandmates. That's the biggest thing you can do for us this week. And what's the thing they can do for themselves, Paul? Always be performing. That's it.